Welcome to The Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. Before I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app that teaches you how to think and solve problems with fun, interactive lessons in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Of course, you knew that. With Brilliant's hands-on approach, you'll learn by doing instead of listening to lectures. It's a better and more fun way to learn. All of Brilliant's courses have storytelling, code writing, interactive challenges, and problems to solve. Brilliant offers many well-curated sequences of problems that help you to master all sorts of technical subjects. If you're interested in physics, you can try out their courses on classical mechanics and gravitational physics. If you like computers and coding, you can check out their courses on computer science fundamentals and programming with Python. Anyway, Brilliant has a vast array of courses, lots and lots in other fields as well, that can help you achieve your goals in STEM, starting with one small commitment to learning and building up to long-term challenge and growth. To check out the many courses available and find out the one that's right for you, you can go to brilliant.org. And to get a free sign up for free or free trial, you go to brilliant.org slash Michael Shermer. That's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S-H-E-R-M-E-R. Just make sure you get it right. Brilliant.org slash Michael Shermer. You sign up for free and uh, give it a shot. Um, as you know, I'm very interested in all forms of online content. I consume a lot of it myself and Brilliant is a great new website. Check it out. All right. Thanks for listening. And here's the podcast. My guest today is Catherine Page Harden, she just goes by Page, The Genetic Lottery, Why DNA Matters for Social Equality. Okay, really important book, just a great book. It's important because this whole issue has been so uh, associated with the kind of racist far right, white supremacist far right, and so on, uh, and so much pseudoscience from the last century uh, that it's become a taboo topic, and uh, Paige is very much on the left, politically self-identified, and that's an important, unfortunately, <laughs> an important proviso for this conversation, not, not my conversation, the national conversation on that. So we start there just talking about uh, you know why this whole project is so uh, politicized and racialized and so forth. Uh, we talk a little bit about uh, Charles Murray and the bell curve, but not that much. Um, and instead really look at um, what we mean by genetics and say something's heritable. <clears throat> we go through the three laws of behavior genetics and what they mean, what we can really learn from twin studies. Um, we talk about polygenetic scores, which is the weighted sum of an individual's relevant genetic variants, and then the genome-wide association studies that uh, people like uh, Paige conduct and what that can tell us about various social outcomes that we're interested in particularly education, spent a lot of time on education. Um, we talk about intelligence, Gattaca, you know, does all this research lead to an ultimate sci-fi scenario like Gattaca? No, and we explain why that is. Um, then Head Start programs and other social programs, do they work? Well, first of all, what do you mean by work? So we get into that. Uh, and then the distinction between science and morality, that is to what extent IQ scores matter or not, or that um, they're heritable or not, is irrelevant to um, moral values and rights that uh, people should be treated equally, for example. Talk about epigenetics and um, and then wrap up talking about social justice, anti-racism, Black Lives Matter, move for e equality of outcomes versus the equality of opportunity. So I argue on one end of that, and she argues toward the other end that is I'm in favor of uh, equal opportunities, regardless of the outcomes, and then she shows uh, how that's not so simple. Anyway, she makes some really good points that made me think about that. Touch a little bit on reparations in UBI, although not too much, because that's not really her field of study, uh, but some of her findings in the book do um, speak to that. So then we wrap up talking about uh, volition and moral culpability, free will, um, and then what's next on her research. So enjoy the conversation. Thanks for listening and thanks for your support. So we know that identical twins raised in separate environments have similar levels of religiosity, spirituality, and many other characteristics. There can't be a gene for Catholicism or, or something like that. 
uh, or even in the more simple examples like uh, Nancy Siegel's the research on twins and the and the and the, mm-hmm. the twins that giggled the same way. They each wore rubber bands on their hands, and they even used the same toothpaste, this uh, Vatter Mecum toothpaste from Sweden. I mean, there can't be a gene for these kinds of specific things. So kind of explain uh, how genetics could influence your preference for religiosity or spirituality or toothpaste preference or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a mistake. I love those types of examples, you know, genes associated with toothpaste preference or genes associated with religiosity or with political beliefs, which are so clearly socially constructed. Um, An example I talk about a lot that came up in the New Yorker article was, you know, we know that divorce is heritable. Um, These are clearly socially constructed behaviors that we can't understand just purely at the level of, of molecules and cells. Like what does it mean to be divorced is something we define at the level of, of interactions between people in a particular society with reference to particular laws. Same thing with religion, same thing with politics. So I really think of it in terms of, you know, our genes are influencing very basic aspects of our, um, our temperaments, um, you know, our, uh, our personalities in the, in this sort of per- way that you might measure personality in babies, right? Like if you have a newborn, you can see that some are more easily soothed than others or others are more, um, rhythmic in their day-to-day needs. They go to sleep at the same time and they eat at the same time every day. And then with these embodied characteristics, we are then put into a social situation where we're faced with repeated choices. And so those embodied characteristics are sort of refracted through the the choices that are available to us. So I think in the case of politics, it's not that there's like a Democrat gene, um, but there's probably a, you know, uh, well, there definitely is genetic influences on your disgust tolerance or your um, preferences for novelty. And then given the way that we construct political parties in our current system, people tend to find themselves in one political party or the other in ways that are, you know, roughly approximate to some of their personality characteristics. Although we can certainly find examples of very open to experience with Republicans. So I think religiosity works the same way. You know, I think a child that is born, like my son, when he was born, I could never figure out what he needed because it was never that he was hungry at the same time every day or sleepy at the same time every day. He, and even now I'm like, are you bored? Are you hungry? Are you cranky? What's going on with you? Whereas my daughter was very easy to predict her needs because she was very rhythmic. And then you think about, well, here are religions that require you to do the same thing every day in the same sequence. Who's going to have an easier time with that versus a harder time with that? So. I think that we have very basic personality traits and then they get sort of um, pushed into the different social roles that we play depending on the options that are available to us. I think that's also why you see that genetic influence as measured by either measured genetic studies or twin studies. You know, a lot of times people think that the influence of genes is gonna be the biggest when people are first born. And then there's going to be these like slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that like environment's going to sort of accrue on top of that. But actually what you see is that heritability estimates tend to go up. They're bigger in adulthood than they are in adolescence and they're bigger in adolescence than they are in childhood. So even as people are accruing environment, the relative influence of genes seems to matter more. And that's because people are increasingly picking their own environments. They're selecting what they want. Um, David Licken, the behavior geneticist at Minnesota, had this great phrase, uh, the cafeteria of experience, right? And like, as you go through life, you increasingly choose things that are reflective of your own personality characteristics. Right. So it sort of reverses the causal arrow. I'm a Democrat, let's say, because, not because I think they have the right arguments on gun control and abortion and 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 so on, the planks of the platform, but that I prefer mm-hmm. that kind of general worldview that Democrats embrace, sort of openness to immigrants, 
people who enjoy travel are more likely to vote be liberal, say, for example, or exposed to novel environments like you do when you travel a lot. Um, and, and just by temperament, I, I feel like these are my people. I feel more comfortable being around people that are Democrats, let's say, even if I don't even know what they are. Uh, and then I kind of nose around for which is the party that I want to join. It's like, well, these are my people. All right. Now, what are your arguments that I can use <laughs> when I'm in a conversation? <laughs> when somebody says, why are you a Democrat? Oh, well, because of gun control and abortion and so forth. Yeah. So that that's yeah. that's what you're saying. Well, I mean, I think that's a reasonable story that we can tell about how it comes to be that genetically more different people are more likely to be different. Um, not just in their height or their eye color, but in something like political ideology. And it's very similar to, um, I think John Haidt's first book was on this, um, on, you know, we, we have these kind of intuitive moral judgments or these intuitive, this is my group and that's your group, um, joinings first. And then we often look for reasons and rationality to support that afterwards. And it takes quite a deal, you know, I think a good deal of work, um, to break out of that, which, you know, to come to bring this back to the book project, I think is part of why the book project is, you know, facing my book, The Genetic Lottery has a an uphill battle, because I think genetics has been conscripted into these kind of tribal affiliations, like we believe this about genes, or we believe this about intelligence. And I'm asking people to kind of re-examine some of those really intuitive beliefs. And I think, you know, as many people have seen in response to the book and to the New Yorker article, um, people are reluctant to do that. That's hard. That's a, that's a big ask of people to, to reevaluate um, their sense of what beliefs cohere with their kind of in-group, out-group. Because the whole study of genetics has largely been affiliated with the right for the past century. And a lot of really bad things, <laughs> uh, discrimination all the way to genocide. And, uh, you know, so you, you can kind of see why. And therefore, your book, you know, they kind of, I mean, your publicist makes a pretty big deal about the fact she's on the left. <laughs> it, it's sort of, it's a little bit like when I recommend people read uh, Francis Collins' book, The Language of God, when I, I recommend my Christian friends, that is, my conservative Christian friends, because he is an evangelical born-again Christian, and he says evolution happened. I wouldn't give a, one of these people Dawkins' book, because they're going to go, well, he's on the other team, right? So yeah. that's what you mean about it's so tribal, and why your book, I think, is a hopefully a breath of fresh air for this uh what did they call it? What did, what did your uh, mentor call it? The uh, search for the psychometric left? <laughs> <laughs> the search or, for um, the psychometric left. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is an old <laughs> phrase, right? It's like psychometric, psycho, psychometricians, right? It's like the measurement of psychology, psychometrics. And, um, you know, Jensen, um, in addition to riling people up with his kind of incendiary, there's no way we're going to be able to boost IQ. So R. Jensen was a Harvard psychologist in the 19, uh, who in the 1960s published a sort of infamous article that you were referring to earlier called How Much Can We Boost IQ and Scholastic Achievement? And his basic idea was that, you know, if something is quote unquote genetic, if, if school achievement is heritable, then there's this kind of hard ceiling on how much we can improve it. Um, but in addition to you know, these kind of really incendiary and, and I think actually incorrect, I disagree with Jensen's conclusions, articles, he also did a number of things on just like the basics of, you know, IQ testing. Like, what does it mean for a test to be biased? Um, and so I, I like that phrase of Eric Turkheimer's, who was my PhD mentor at UVA, in search of the psychometric left, because it's really speaking to um, in this field in which just measuring things about people can in itself be controversial. How can we articulate that as a scientific project separate from this kind of, this kind of political baggage that comes with it um, uh, of people being sort of opposed to, um, for instance, uh, the, you know, if you're thinking about the political context in which R. Jensen was writing, like opposition to so much of what we, you know, did become civil rights legislation. So how can we uncouple the, this, this field of psychometrics and then more generally behavior genetics 
from these these kind of reactionary politics from which has been embedded for decades at this point in time. Yeah, here's what he wrote. A psychometric left would recognize that human ability, individual differences in human ability, measures of human ability, and genetic influences on human ability are all real and but profoundly complex, too complex for the imposition of biogenetic or political schemata. It would assert that the most important difference between the races is racism and its origins in the horrific institution of slavery only a very few generations ago. Opposition to determinism, reductionism, and racism in their extreme or moderate forms need not depend on blanket rejection of undeniable, if easily misinterpreted facts like heritability. Uh, indeed, it better not because if it does, the eventual victory of the psychometric right is assured. Yes, okay, so mm-hmm. you know the right has largely been the problem. Although, to be fair, I should point out, remember when uh, that article by John Jost came out? I think it was called Why People uh, Vote Republican or why people are concerned, something like that. It, almost like it was a disease. And the whole thing was kind of premised on why did these people, this huge group of people, believe these crazy ideas as if we were talking about UFOs or something? They're Republicans. You know, it's half the country. Mm-hmm. And, you know, conservative. Mm-hmm. And it was a lot of the stuff like, uh, you know, behavior genetic research about some people are, are more sensitive to loud noises and they startle m- more readily and they don't like to mix with people that are different from them racially, and therefore they vote more uh, restrictions on immigration, things like this. But a lot of conservatives, I I remember uh, this was on all the talk shows, uh, you know, lost their minds about this saying, you know, well, actually, these beliefs are actually better for society. And, uh, you know, kind of pushed back against the structure, just the, the question as it was asked as if it was a problem that people are Mm -hmm. Republican or, or, or identify as conservative. And so I could kind of see that cutting both ways, although mostly on the right. But uh, but but to be fair, on the left, you have, you know, what what I call cognitive creationism or blank slateism is you know, Steve Pinker's book or Judith Rich Harris, The Nurture Assumption. It, it, that can't that that can't be right. The environment has to operate on something It has to operate on a platform of some kind called neurons. And they're made of proteins and these proteins are designed by genes. So genes have to have some effect. So let's. Let's start with the laws, your yeah. your uh, mentors, three laws of behavior genetics and what they mean. <laughs> three laws of behavior genetics and what they mean. You, yeah. You, you so, probably I mean, memorized. this is probably Eric's. I do. Yeah. Well, it came out in 2000, right? So, it's interesting to think about how durable that paper is, right? It was 21 years ago that it was published. And the first law of behavior genetics is everything is heritable. And by that, he means if we are looking at differences in behavior in a group of people, whether that behavior is how quickly can you solve math problems, how likely are you to go to a party, um, how likely are you to become depressed, um, those differences between people are going to be associated with genetic differences between them or more genetically different people will have more different lives is basically what heritability is about i think what's been a problem in psychology is to what extent is that ignorable so environments yes they operate on neurons they operate on brains they operate on people that are embodied um can we kind of wave wave that heterogeneity that those differences between people and say well we're, we're just not really concerned with that like this is that part of the equation and i'm interested in the environmental part of the equation um or does in fact the 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 existence of these genetic differences complicate our ability to study the environment and i think that the latter point is what i think the problem in psychology is that it's difficult to study environments if genetic differences are not accounted for in any way whatsoever. Um, But I've also found that that's really profoundly unintuitive for people that um, as a clinical, I was trained as a clinical psychologist, that's what my PhD is in. You know, my research, so much of it is on the environments that affect children and teenagers. And I'm interested in genetics in large part because I want to get it out of the way, right? Like I want to um, understand 
you know, what is affecting kids? And I can't do that effectively if the environments that I'm studying are also related to the genes that children are inheriting. Um, so that is like that on one level is a very basic point, but on the other level is a radical point because it requires people who are primarily interested in the environment to take genetics seriously as a, as a source of individual differences in people's lives. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important messages of your book, that people have just not heard that. It just needs to be repeated over and over and over. You actually <laughs> absolutely have to understand this in order to control for it as an intervening variable so we can look mm -hmm. at the things we can, mm -hmm. can do something about and exactly what we can do. You mentioned divorce. Okay. So in the personal article on you, it said you were, you're, you've been divorced. I've been divorced. But if you ask me, why why'd you get divorced? I wouldn't say, well, you know, it's in my genes, some level of it. Some, I would just say, no. <laughs> well, I wouldn't here's say what that happened. either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she did this, yeah. and then I did that, and then the whole thing unraveled. It'd just be purely environment, 100%. So in what way is, mm -hmm. does genetics have anything to do with, say, divorce? Well, if you look at, you know, even not, not no, psychologists that have nothing to do with genetics, but they just study um dating marriage and marital conflict mm. so one of my best okay. friends who used to live in austin is a researcher paul eastwick and he lives in davis california now and he does these fantastic studies of um speed dating for instance where it's like you say you want this but this is the person whose number you actually want at the end of the night or these studies of relationship um dissolution like when you've first gotten together with someone you know at what point do you realize this is a short-term relationship versus, versus a long-term relationship and then also what is it about each member of a couple that predicts the likelihood of their experiencing high levels of marital conflict or divorce and what you see is one of the biggest predictors of marital conflict is the personality trait of neuroticism right are you an emotionally labile anxious depressed person it turns out that you're harder to live with <laughs> and you have more conflict in your close relationships than if you are a sunny, not prone to anxiety, um, you know, uh, dispositionally easy person. Um, and I don't think that is surprising to anyone. I think we can all think right. about previous of our partners and be like, that one was neurotic and that one was less neurotic <laughs> and that, you know, influenced the ease of building a relationship that had durability. Um, and then if you're thinking about like, well, where did that come from? Like, where does my proneness towards depression and anxiety come from? You know, there's a ton of good research on infant temperament, you know, um, Jerome Kagan's work about the inhibited child and how that's related to later proneness to anxiety. And I think that's, um, obviously influenced by our biology. So I think for all of these questions, it's about you might have you know identified a theme where it's like about building kind of the chains right where this aspect of your temperament gives rise to this aspect of your adult personality which is then responded to in certain ways by the people you're in relationship with or by your society that leads to some outcome um you know i i think that i this probably isn't great for like you know an individual prognostication but given a sample of people like me and my brother, and my brother is very easygoing and very chill and me and I'm not like, you know, I don't think it's a huge surprise that I'm the one of the two of us who ended up um, experiencing a divorce and not him. And, you know, I think that that doesn't, that's not an excuse, but it's a partial explanation. I think about why we, you know, we experience our relationships differently. Pedro, you tell me you're hard to live with. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am not the easiest person to live with. I will confess that here. <laughs> Let's wade into another hot button topic. Uh, you know, gender yeah. differences in 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 uh, in professions. Let's say the Google memo. Jamie Damore waded into a hot button issue there. Now, I don't think he was arguing women are not capable of programming. Of course, they are. But it was a kind of a temperament preference for the kind of jobs you would prefer to do and that there are these men, women, gender differences and, you know, women like people, things and men like mechanical things or things versus people, something like that. So you get more women in, in, in uh, say, medicine. Now there's more women in medicine than men. 
but in programming, that's more of a thing. So I think that was Jamie's point. Of course, it was interpreted as you're saying uh, women can't do coding or some, uh, programming at Google, whatever. But, the, but, but it gets back down to, well, what's the baseline rate from which, say, eighth graders then bifurcate into going into math and science and STEM fields versus, you know, people oriented fields. And there, the, the, so maybe there's still misogyny there, you know, it's possible of course, but, but maybe it's just a temperament preference selection. And that's going to look like there's some discrimination at, in fortune 500 companies against women to having those kinds of jobs versus other kinds of jobs, because there's an asymmetry in the number. How do you think about that issue? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I, I have kind of two reactions to that. And the first is, you know, it's interesting when we look at the results of the, um, the genome-wide association studies of education. Um, you know, most genome-wide association studies where you're looking across the genome to, to, to look at individual genetic variants that correlate with some outcome, most often you're looking at the autosomes, so not the sex chromosomes. Um, but increasingly there's more work on, is there anything going on with the X chromosome with regards to genetics of association? Do you see different patterns of association between men and women in education? And on the whole, the answer to all of that has been no. That, you know, when we're looking at from the the perspective of the GWAS from the perspective of which bits of DNA are correlated with going further in school, uh, we don't know why any one bit of DNA is correlated with going further in school, but it seems to be generally the same bits for men and women. You see really, really consistent patterns. Um, so from that lens, you're not like any story about like genetic differences between men and women, at least with regards to what a GWAS is picking up for education, which is a very coarse. Um, approach to it. You're not really seeing much. I think what I often find dissatisfying about that, the kind of, well, is it just um, different preferences for women or different personality traits that make them kind of self-select out? Um, a lot of times that conversation, I think, is insufficiently focused on the question of how we value in our society different forms of labor. Like, I think that we would generally care less about the question of whether or not on average, men are more interested in things and women are inter more interested in people. If the sort of work that women disproportionately do to take care of people was, um, was valued in terms of allowing them to have um, yes, you know, right. financial security and stability and prestige. And so I think so many of these conversations about sex differences end up being around how do we get more equal representation of men and women for professions that are atop a prestige hierarchy without really interrogating the prestige hierarchy itself. Um, so, so that, that's kind of like my, like so much of the conversation around that Google memo. Um, I, I just, you know, wasn't interrogating in my mind sufficiently the differences in prestige and security and dignity across different forms of labor. Um, and then the second thing, and I'll just talk to my experiences like as a woman in science here, which is that in the individual case, you know, we can tell stories about how on average, if you have these preferences, you end up making these choices. But those choices are always, you know, choices within a certain set of social constraints. Um, and it's really hard to anticipate how those choices would be different if the social constraints were different. Um, so, you know, in my, my kind of general view is that um, a good society is one in which people have more good choices and they're not constantly deciding between bad choices. And I think a lot of times, you know, we give women in science a set of kind of impossible choices. And then and then the the narrative of choice around that feels feels to me and I think to many women as incomplete um, in terms of thinking about the structural factors that have, you know, um, 
shaped that choice, those choices and the choices that they do make over many years. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, and I would point that back at feminists who have uh, argued that, you know, women should get out there in the in the workplace and be CEOs and so on. They've kind of handed it over to the men saying, you guys have all the prestige and power and money and we want it or we want our share. That's assuming that that that's a better job. Who who wants to be a CEO of a company? I I know some. I don't want to. I don't, I don't, I don't want to work eighty hours a week and and be stressed out and have no social life, no personal life, no family life, no exercise. I mean, in programming at Google, I don't want to work at Google. <laughs> that's like a real job. Yeah. You know, those guys work. You know, sick. Yeah. Most of them are single because they they that's all they do is work. Yeah, they give you free food and you get to play volleyball on your breaks. But you know, you got to work sixty eighty hours a week. Who wants to do that? You know, to me, that's not the prestigious I mean, I job is, at all. <laughs> it's one of, you know, this is the, the word intersectionality is thrown around a lot. And I know can can um, strike people as it's controversial to just even bring that up. But I think one of the things that I've learned from people who identify as intersectional feminists is this critique of. Um, kind of lean in girl boss feminism where we're going to have the exact same hierarchies of of power and prestige and we're not going to interrogate those we're just going to make sure that there's you know more gender diversity at the top um and that isn't really a you know a a project that i think is fully um is fully egalitarian you know when i think about you know, kind of circling back to the, some of the themes that i talk in the book you know, I think a big part of my discontent with many of the debates about genetics and education is rooted in my dissatisfaction with this idea that it's all about can we get people to compete better in our kind of like meritocratic competitions, right? Like, let's get more poor kids to code. That just seems to me like a profoundly insufficient response to the problems of oppression in this country. Um, it's not to me about how can we make sure that there's, you know, not just about like, how can we change the representation of students in our most elite selective institutions? Um, but how can we make the experiences of labor and education more broadly accessible for everyone? And that seems to me like a different kind of goal. Um, Yes, well, that that uh, controversy is still going on of the parents that basically yes. cheated the selection system to get into the elite colleges. You know, just shows how powerful that norm is. You know, until you think about it for a second, what difference does it make whether you go to Harvard or Yale or USC or UCLA or you go to a state university uh, that's not quite as prestigious? You're very likely getting the best, if not even a better education. In the case of like going to a community college or a, just a general state college, you're more likely to actually have the real professors as your teachers rather than graduate students because mm -hmm. the professor is under pressure to publish and he's in the lab or she's in the lab all the time. And uh, so, but we still have this, you know, you got to get, I, I have a 30-year-old a daughter and a, and a five-year-old son now. <laughs> and uh, I remember when my daughter was young and we got her into this all-girls school in Pasadena Westridge School for Girls. Oh, it's a, it's they're gonna get them all into these Ivy League schools, and I'm like, yeah, okay. And then, then one of the moms was like, if my daughter doesn't get into Harvard, you know, my life is ruined, basically. I'm like, what? Okay, this is getting crazy, right? You know, why, why is that? You know, so there, I, th I think the problem is not so much in, in our genes or individuals. It's society at large has kind of constructed this narrative. These are the most important, valuable things in in life, and yeah. yet, you know, I know, well, I know. I think Go ahead. Well, I don't know if you've read, um, you know, Michael Sandel's work about meritocracy, yeah. Um, yeah. but I think a I number agree. of people have increasingly made this point that a culture that's devoted to everything is a locus of competition and this kind of winner take all and this sense of um, precarity that no matter how much how much money you've accumulated right now, um, it could be taken away and that you need to shore up your children's future however you can. I think that that felt precarity that comes from the culture of meritocracy 
affects everyone. And it doesn't just hurt people who we would recognize as relatively disadvantaged. I think parents all the way up and down the socioeconomic ladder feel that I have this now, but it could be taken away from me. I have to make sure that my children can compete. Um, and so a lot of felt psychological pressure around this. And then often, you know, when we're talking about the elite institutions, you know, we're not just talking about education in terms of learning, we're talking about power. We're talking about to what extent are you within elite powerful networks? And so obviously that, that um, you know, becomes a locus of anxiety for people. But it depends what you want in life and what the goal is. I mean, I mean just reflect back to push back into the, the narrative. I mean, if the goal is to lead a, a happy, fulfilling, meaningful, purposeful life, there's a gazillion ways to do that without ever going to Harvard, without programming at Google or you know, no, no, that's or anything true. like that. <laughs> you know, yeah, and just. No, uh, that's definitely, I mean, I, I mean, I totally agree with you there. And I think one thing that we as a culture don't do as well as we could is at celebrating and recognizing the paths through education and through labor markets that are not, um, that are not, do not require getting a PhD, but that still can give someone a good and meaningful and um, life where they feel like they're contributing and they have security for themselves and their family. You know, one of my favorite examples is that, that, you know, the median salary for a plumber in the Washington, D.C. area is higher than the median salary yes. for a first year assistant professor of English, right? <laughs> I love that. Um, but we have our prestige hierarchies of which one of those careers yes. is better. Um, and, you know, thinking about not just how can we get more people through college, but how can we make it so that more people feel like they have the ingredients of a good life regardless of whether or not they go to college. That seems to me really critical for dismantling some of the agita that attends right now any of our conversations about um, you know, genetics and biology in relation to intelligence and personality and education. Yeah, so even if we convince everybody you don't have to go to college to lead a fulfilling, meaningful life, you do have to have some level of education. Right. We can't stop it at, say, sixth grade and expect somebody to function on any level in society. We want rational voters and to be able to read the New York Times or Wall Street Journal and, mm -hmm. you know, consume content reasonably well uh, without having to go to an elite college. OK, so there then the question is, um, you know, to, to your research, to what extent can we improve that? Let's just say Head Start program through eighth grade or 10th grade or something like that. That mm -hmm. seems to be where the controversy is and where a lot of the, our problems are, right? We have failing schools and, uh, you know, so talk a little bit about what the research is on that. Do Head Start programs work? Uh, and what do we mean by work? <laughs> and what's our yeah. measured yeah. outcome we're looking for? Yeah, so, um, so there's a couple of things. And one is that, you know, yes, we can improve how children do in school. And yes, we should. Um, even if we're not thinking of education, as you say, primarily as a engine towards, you know, getting everyone to get a STEM PhD, education is a good in and of itself. You know, it is a capability that is a, is a human functioning that we want to nurture. Um, I don't think that we do as a society and as an education system a, as good a job at that as we can. Um, if you think about what we're going through now with children having been out of school, some of them for months due to COVID-related uh, schooling disruptions, you're seeing kind of massive gaps between where children ordinarily are and where they are now. Um, I think in Texas, they're estimating that it's gonna take on average four years to, for children to catch up to where they would have been in math without COVID, you know, a truly massive. Really? Um, what? Yes, so, um, and we see this, um you know for the subjects and for the grades for which we have the fewest effective interventions um so there's definitely examples of i mean jim heckman has this is his work um the nobel prize winning economist on investments in early childhood education which do have really great returns um not necessarily for the 
the sorts of skills that are tested on IQ tests, but for adult labor market outcomes, um, avoiding contact with the criminal justice system, you know, uh, these kinds of indicators of, you know, a, of, of a adult life that's going well, certainly our investments in early childhood education pay off. The situation becomes more difficult as children get older and our arsenal of effective tools for educational interventions get smaller and smaller as kids you know, move into middle childhood and then into adolescence. Uh, a colleague of mine at the University of Texas um, specifically focuses on educational interventions for high school students and notes in his papers that like basically almost nothing works. So most RCTs, most randomized controlled trials of educational interventions, particularly of things that we're trying in uh, middle childhood or adolescence, make no difference on average. Um, so, you know, we're trying this tutoring program or we're trying this new math curriculum or we're trying this new change in class size or et cetera. And then you look and you see that the children who were randomized to the treatment that people were excited about, they don't look any different than the kids in the control group. Um, Meaning so there's a the lot of reasons for the, the measured outcome yeah. on some standardized test later So on some standardized test or some kind of more distal indicator like, um, you know, high school graduation rates or not feeling a grade or something like that. So when we're thinking about, um, you know, do we know, even if political will weren't a problem, which it obviously is, but let's say that we had unanimous support in the US for investing in high quality public education. What does that look like? Do we know exactly where are the most effective levers of change to pull on are. And I don't think that we do. There's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the reasons for that is that our interventions and policy proposals are based on a basic research, body of basic research where researchers are saying, well, this is correlated with this, so we should change this, right? Like. Um, you know, parents who eat dinner with their kids have kids that do better in math, so we should teach parents to have dinner with their kids, right? And those studies are hugely problematic. We cannot go around reporting correlations between parental behavior and child outcomes without controlling for the fact that parents and children are genetically related and expect to come up with a really robust research basis of environmental targets for intervention. Um, so, you know, I think it's clear that education works. We have some really great examples of improving education and investing in children in ways that um, really improve their whole lives. Um, the lesson of genetics is not that the environment doesn't matter. It's that figuring out which environment matters is more difficult than it might first appear. Um, and so that's where I think the power of genetics is. When I start talking about genetics, people always want to jump to like personalized education or embryo selection. Mm. And really, <laughs> I think what we should be talking about is how do we make the, the day to day research that researchers are already doing to try to figure out which environments matter for kids lives and how to change them? How do we make that research better? I think that's the most um, the most shovel ready uh, high value implementation of genetics right now. Shovel ready, I like that. Yeah. So the problem is uh, <laughs> is that these are publicly funded programs like Head Start or public schools, and we don't have an unlimited amount of money uh, unless maybe this modern monetary theory takes off, and then you can government can print all the mm -hmm. money it wants. Apparently, but I just can't see that going indefinitely. Uh, so we have to make hard choices. Okay. So uh, and 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 we have to have some kind of metric to see if it's working so that's going to be an average score compared to the the a b test the the before and after and and so mm -hmm. on but yeah so i mean the idea say behind head start let's get kids started super early before even kindergarten uh and, i mean that sounds like a good in itself and i i think it is i think it is as an individually so here, let me just reflect on this for a second, uh, thinking out loud. I was thinking about Judith Rich Harris's book, The Nurture Assumption, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the, you know, the media reception of this book, you know, is uh, parents don't matter as if 
if your kid doesn't get into Harvard, then you failed as a parent because 20 years ago you didn't do the X, Y, and Z and so on. But, but, but the rebuttal to that is that's not why you do these things for your kids. You don't do them for some outcome 15 years from now. You do it because you love them right now. Today, I want to make the next hour for my little guy really fun. So we're going to build a little toy together uh, and, and play. I don't care if, he, if it makes a difference or not in 20 years on some standardized test. I don't. But I guess we can't say that as a society if we're going to use tax dollars and go, all right, we're going to spend $100 million on this program so that this kid who's five, when he's 20, he'll be able to do X. And then you don't see any difference. And then conservatives go, you see, we wasted our money. It's like, well, <laughs> you see where I'm going with that. Yeah, I do. I have a couple of re- th- thoughts in response. And the first is, you know, Judith Rich Harris, you know, she wrote this book and she was like, children raised in the same home who aren't genetically related, who are adopted, or after we take into account their genetic relationship, children who are raised in the same home don't end up similar in their life outcomes. And that should really make us pause when we think about how important parents are parenting individual differences between parents in terms of how much they make a difference for kids' outcomes. Um, and Robert Plowman, the behavior geneticist in the UK, has made similar statements. Um, the thing is, is that's true when we're looking at twin and adoption studies of personality or of psychopathology. It's not true when we're looking at years of education. So even in twin studies, you see that there's this shared environmental effect for your likelihood of going to university, your number of years of education. Um, there was just it recently in scientific reports a very large meta-analysis across multiple birth cohorts in multiple countries um, that replicated that uh, that uh, finding that there is this kind of shared environmental effect on education. There's one study that I really like out of the University of Minnesota that's basically like, you know, your family environment might not raise your IQ scores that much, but it will get you into college. And I think that tells us something about the way that privilege works and and the limitations of privilege, at least in American educational systems as they're currently constructed. So, you know, I think even separate from like buying their buying their way, their kids way into college with like fake lacrosse or whatever that scandal was, you know, parents can parents with privilege can buffer their children regardless of they were kind of set of it, of more heritable traits. Like, I don't think that I can, um, with my own children, make them less, you know, less or more neurotic or less or more extroverted or even necessarily appreciably make a difference in their likelihood of getting an anxiety disorder. Um, but I can hire them a counselor in high school if they need to get over their test-taking anxiety so that they can sit for their standardized exams, that sort of thing. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm hes- I just want to push back a little bit on the narrative that parents don't make a difference for educational outcomes, because even with twin studies, we see evidence that they do. Um, I, my other thought in response to that is I think, you know, this idea of. Is this a means or an end really bedevils so many of our conversations about parenting and psychology? Like if I say. Um, uh, you know, having this type of physical environment for your school doesn't make kids' test scores better. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have better physical environments for kids. Like, I think regardless of whether or not it improves their test scores, like all children should go to schools and in aesthetically pleasing, adequately warm, adequately cool, well-equipped, non-roach infested, like, where would you want to spend time? Like children are little people. Like we should respect their experiences, qua experiences as they're having them. Um, but so often people fight those kind of um, moral debates about ends that they think are good. Like I think children should have this type of educational experience on these sort of instrumental grounds. Like, well, don't say that it won't affect their test scores. Like it might not affect their test scores. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. So I, you know, so much of these conversations are so fraught because it can be hard to know whether or not someone is really arguing about 
the empirical relationship. If we change this, we'll get this outcome. Or are people arguing about this is a good thing to do regardless of what effects it has on, on kids later on? Yeah, well, of course, there's a lot of good things we could do, but we can't afford. <laughs> so you can't do everything. So mm -hmm. that's the need for data and for people like you to tell us what's the right thing to do. Just to show how hard it is, here's a quote from you. Even if we eliminated all inequalities in educational outcomes between sexes, all inequalities by family socioeconomic status, all inequalities between different schools, which as you know, are very confounded with inequalities by race, we've only eliminated a bit more than a quarter of the inequalities in educational outcomes. Where, where's the rest of that? Where's the other 75%? Uh, people are different from one another. I mean, I think this is really, you know, if there's something that there's something that being a psychologist has most impressed upon me is that even when we're talking, even even when we have restricted our scope to a very um, narrow slice of human, the you know, human global diversity, which are, you know, American school children. People are so different from each other. The scale of variability, I think, is always something that we underestimate. This is one of my favorite things that happens. Um, I employ undergrad RAs and they run participants through our lab. So they get trained in doing, you know, an assessment, like giving an IQ test or giving a personality test. And they do, you know, one or two practice assessments and they really think they've got it under their belt. And then they spend a summer testing kid after kid after kid after kid after kid. And at the end of the summer, they've seen hundreds of children. And even if they're on a Zoom screen because of COVID, we're doing our assessments virtually right now, you still see the differences in the background and the differences in the background noise and what mom is doing and what the kids look like and how they interact with the um, assessment. And they walk away and they're like, I never knew that people that, you know, eight-year-olds were so different. Um, so there's this enormous scale of variability in some of that is genetic differences between us. Humans are incredibly genetically diverse. Um, and some of that is, you know, what my colleague has called developmental noise and we might call randomness. We might call that stochasticity. Um, I, so much of our conversation about inequality in America is about inequality along dimensions that are easy for us to see gender race, social class, and that can elide the inequalities across dimensions that we can't see, which is just the incredible scope of variability amongst people. Yeah, the problem social scientists have is you, you got to have a box to tick. Which one are you, married or divorced? Are you, <laughs> uh, you know, first born, later born? Are you, uh, how much do you make? Zero to 50, 51 to 100, and so on. You got to tick a box, right? So that we can have yeah. some kind of correlation and run these regression analysis and, and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, what are you even talking about? That's what you're supposed to do. But that's delimiting is your point there. Um, yeah. So well, let me one just, of my favorite go studies. Oh, go ahead. No, I want to hear about your favorite study. <laughs> oh, well, one it's one of, I, was that one of my favorites? Like I didn't conduct it. One of my favorite studies that I've ever read is, is on the unpredictability of, human life outcomes. And it's this study where they, I talk about it a little bit in the book, where they have measured essentially everything they can think to measure on these children from birth until age 12. And then they give the data to um, 160 different teams of researchers. And they say, I want you to take all this data and build a model and tell me what these children are gonna be like at age 15. And it turns out that even with this wealth of data, we're talking 12,000 variables over 12 years, 160 different teams of scientists, none of them can explain more than 20% of the variation in how children look at age 15. Um, and you know, what does that mean? I think some people can take that to mean to be really depressing about you know, the capacity of social science to predict something about how kids do. Um, but there's also something I find a little bit comforting about that, that humans, humans have a, an incredible capacity to surprise um, scientists' best guess about what they're going to do next. We, there's so much variability and unpredictability in our lives. 
Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, that doesn't surprise me, though. Uh, I mean, just I think you talked about I think you talked about in the book, the number of genes involved just in height, which is highly heritable and seems like it'd be relatively yeah. simple. Was it like thirteen hundred genes or something? And you oh, still only account, I mean, those are, get accounts for like 10 yes. percent of the variance or something. Just nothing. Yeah. Yeah. No, so for I mean, something all like things I, that we're talking about. For, for something like IQ, intelligence, whatever word you want to use for this, cognitive abilities, much less religiosity. I mean, there's just the the chances of capturing very much of the percentage of variance is pretty low, even if you're just studying genetics, just the twin studies. Yeah, I mean, I think our, uh, there's another great paper that I really like, which is about effect sizes. You know, what when we say that something has a big effect or a small effect, what are we talking about? And their point there is, you know, small effects can be meaningful in the long run. But humans are so variable that we shouldn't expect any one factor, including their genetics, and, and in particular, any one genetic variant, because for all of these things, we're talking about, you know, thousands upon thousands of different genetic variants. Um, it is this, this confluence of many infinitesimally small things adding up together that shapes who we are. So this would be your rebuttal, which you presented in the book, to the Gattaca scenario that there's no possible way you can engineer, you can take a CRISPR machine and engineer your own baby to be the way you want it to be. Uh, even if you could somehow uh, capture all 1,300 genes for height and manipulate them the way you want, they're not independent. You're going to get uh, side effects because of pleiotropy, right? The genes are located next mm -hmm. to other genes on the chromosome, so you select for one, you get something else, like the famous silver fox mm -hmm. Uh, genetics research in Russia, where they selected mm -hmm. for docility, and they ended up with floppy ears and and uh, little mm -hmm. patches on their forehead and a bunch of other things that they didn't weren't anticipating. So, I mean, there's no way to do this. It's like that. Remember that movie Boys from Brazil, uh, where they uh, this this is the idea that you know that that, that we're going to create another Hitler in in, in South America, uh, wow. and, and oh yeah, so that was the idea. They had his genes, and so they they basically cloned a bunch of baby Hitlers. And then set up a bunch of environments to be as closely matched as as Hitler's own life trajectory, which is impossible. I mean, it's just you know, you're not even in the same decade, uh, not even the same century, much less decade, much less what school he went to or the art his experiences with his mother. You know, to see his father, his father was domineering, you know, but how domineering? You know, you have to have the perfect measures for the father of the child, and you know, just r ridiculous idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, I, there's kind of two directions that we can take that conversation. So another study I really like, um, it was published in Science several years ago, where they took um, genetically very similar mice and they put, they introduced, they raised them under a sort of identical conditions. And then they put them in this big vivarium, like this big cage with all these motion sensors so they could track where the mice were going. And what they see is how randomness turns into personality. That there's random differences in which mice go which where, you know, which place and how much the first day. But that influences their social arrangements for the next day, which influences their social arrangements for the next day, until you have the emergence of these stable patterns of activity and social dominance between the mice, even though they are you know, genetically similar animals who are raised in exactly mm. equal rearing conditions in the lab. Randomness. So at, on the one hand, we have these, you know, these, um, these genetic similarity and the shared environmental similarity. And then we see this emergence of idiosyncratic personality. There's similar lines of research that have been done with bees and with fish, you know, where you see the emergence of, of individuality out of what seems to be randomness. Which again, I think makes it all the more remarkable how similar identical twins are for some of our life outcomes. Because in some cases we see that the identicalness of early experience and genotype still gives rise to difference. And yet for something like education, which takes, you know, in my case, you know, my children asked me what grade I'm in. And I was like, well, I was in the 22nd grade when I finally stopped going to school. It takes decades to complete. And yet we see identical twins so similar for that process at the end. I, 
I think I will never get over finding that just like a remarkable observation about humans that two lives can end up in such similar places. Yes, yes. When you see a a stat like you know fifty percent of the, what what is it identical twins fifty percent of the variance on religiosity or political preference or whatever is accounted for by their genes. Just to be clear, that does not mean fifty percent of X is genetically programmed, and the rest is environment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think genetic programming is this idea that, you know, that all genes work the way that maybe like, um, like a trisomy does with Down syndrome, right? Where if you have, if you have three copies of your 21st chromosome, you're going to develop Downs. And that's going to be true sort of regardless of your historical place and time, right? Like that is, is true in 15th century France as it is today. Whereas almost all of the things we're talking about are these tiny probabilistic effects that are always happening in combination with your environment. And if one part of that changes, the whole system starts moving in a different direction. Right. Just a couple of technical things, make sure we get, get this correct. Explain a polygenic score and a genome-wide association study. What are you guys doing with that in, in relation to these outcomes? Yeah, so a genome-wide association study is where we measure many, many genetic variants across the whole genome, so across the whole stretch of your DNA. Um, this can be hundreds of thousands, this could be millions of different genetic variants, and by variants I mean I have a certain um, sequence at a certain spot and you have a different one. So most often we're looking at one DNA letter differences between people. So I have a G in a certain spot and you have a T right there. And then we are correlating each one of those variants with something that we have measured about people. And ordinarily we're talking about a lot of people. So my colleagues and I, we just published a study that pools data on 1.5 million people and we're measuring um, several hundred thousand genetic variants on all of them. Typically, the, the people in these studies are all um, homogenous, so similar with regards to their genetic ancestry. So if we're you know, going back several generations, um, who were your ancestors? Where did they live? Those people are similar to one another if their ancestors have been you know, living in the same place. Um, and because of where, where we get genetic data, so a lot of this is coming from UK Biobank, um, a lot of people study uh, genetic samples from Iceland. 23andMe is a big source. Um, the biggest group of people in there are people who have European genetic ancestry and so are most likely to be identified as white in the U.S. So it's comparing people who have similar genetic kind of background and seeing of the stuff we've measured, which, which of these is correlated with the thing that we have, that we're interested in studying about you. Um, so in the case of our most recent paper, we were looking at things like ADHD or uh, at what age did you lose your virginity or how many sexual partners have you had? Um, do you have an alcohol problem? Have you ever used marijuana? Are you a smoker? So things that are more what psychologists call on the externalizing spectrum. Um, and so once you've done that, you have a big set of correlations and you can apply that to genetic information from a new set of people. So we've done this study in one and a half million people. Now we can go over here to this new sample and we can say, OK, I'm going to add up information about your all of your DNA using what I've learned from the previous GWAS so that I can add up information about your DNA into a single number. And then I'm going to see. And that single number is called a polygenic index or a polygenic score. Poly meaning many, genic meaning genetic. So it's a many gene score. Um, and then we're seeing how strongly is that correlated with something that I've measured in this new sample of people. So it's kind of like a, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a replication exercise in a lot of ways. Like we think that these genes are correlated with something. Now in a new group of people, if I add up all that information, are they actually correlated with something? Um, what's interesting about these is that they, in some cases, and I think education and externalizing are the two big ones, the polygenic scores are strongly correlated with how far you go in school or do you have externalizing behavior problems with some of the kind of classic social science variables such as family income. So that's really kind of burst genetics 
you know, back onto the scene. Now we can measure something about you that's just in your DNA. And we might not know why it's correlated with your outcomes, but it is as correlated as your outcomes, as some of the things that we're used to studying as psychologists or sociologists. So what would family income, uh, be, how would that be a causal vector? I mean, is it a proxy for something else? I have a nicer home, cleaner environment, better food, higher quality schools, just a whole suite of things. And that's what you're actually picking up. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, that's, it's a very similar case for a polygenic index as something like socioeconomic status or family income, which is family income is a, is a variable that is capturing um, probably innumerable mechanisms, right? So more wealthier women have access to better prenatal care. They're more likely to have planned their pregnancies, so they're taking folic acid even before they get pregnant. They have lower rates of birth complications. Um, they are less likely to smoke, right? They're more likely to read to their kids. They're more likely to not be doing shift work, so they're able to be interacting with their kids at a time when they're alert and they're not, you know, having to bring their kid to a grocery store at 11 p.m. because that's the only time they off, have off from work. Um, they're more likely to be married. So there's another person in the house to engage in that kind of like high intensity parenting that is, the, you know, the norm amongst, you know, affluent couples these days. Um, so we we know that all of these things are going on and income is like this one messy crude indicator of all of them. And that's kind of like a polygenic score. A polygenic score could be capturing any number of processes, many of which kind of seem environmental to us, but it's just collapsing it down into a, into a single number. And then are there racial and or gender differences in these GWAS and polygenic scores? So the gender differences, no. I mean, that's something that we can, or sex differences. We're not looking at gender identity, but yeah. You know, yeah, biological yeah, sex. sex in these. Yep. Um, and there doesn't, you know, so I was talking about this a little bit earlier. There doesn't seem to be any sex differences in the genes associated with education. The race question, no, to the extent that we have only been studying at this point education largely within groups of people who are, you know, of genetic ancestry that's European, that are that are um, racially identified as white. And that information doesn't really tell us about, um, you know, what's going on in populations that are not the populations of study. So people call this kind of like portability problem. It exists even within um, uh, groups of who have similar ancestry. Like if you do a GWAS in rich people and then you apply it to poor people, it doesn't work as well. Right. So um, but as soon as you're starting to jump to people who are very different in terms of their genetic background from the people you've studied, you start to see that these polygenic scores um, don't work well, work in the sense of they're not really capturing any variation in the outcome that you're looking at. Um, but the, all, all those things that make a difference for children, you know, as a society, we, we want to think, well, we should do something about the people that are falling through the cracks. What should we do? And well, one is, well, the government should, you know, provide funding for better schools or Head Start programs or, but, but what about the home? Uh, you know, what, to what extent can the government come in your house and go, we, we want to encourage you to be married, you know? So, well, we, the government actually already does this, right? I, you get a tax, break. I'm married, so I get a, ta I get a tax break. I don't pay as much mm -hmm. as my single friends. Uh, and, and, and home ownership. Well, I get to deduct my, uh, the interest on my mortgage for this house. So that's the government saying, we, we want you to be a homeowner. And uh, now I get an extra bonus because I got another kid, <laughs> right? So, uh, okay, so the government wants me to have more children and be married and live in a house, right? So, I mean, uh, the, the last part of your book, so we can kind of shift toward that, is, is, a lot, is that conversation. You know, to, what mm -hmm. else can the government do? Now, conservatives, as you know, will say it's none of the government's business. You know, these people need these people, the people that fell through the cracks or whatever, who are not mentally ill or have drug addictions or whatever. They just made bad choices. They need, you know, here's, I'll just channel a conservative, <laughs> Christian conservative, like your parents, mm -hmm. maybe. They should be married. They need good moral values that they get from the Bible, the Ten Commandments, chastity, you know, modesty, you know, dress modestly, don't have sex until you're married. You know, just all the kind of stuff like that. 
This is the kind of the conservative argument, and I trust that that's not your argument. I mean, I know it's not your argument now. So yeah, then, it's definitely then, not my argument. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, um, yes, go ahead. Social programs, that's the hard one. The first thing that comes to my mind is, is, a, is a story. Um, I don't know why this, is, this came to my mind, but a good friend of mine, she had her first child in the Netherlands. And she had her second child in California. And I was absolutely astounded by her experiences of being a new mom in the Netherlands because she had a nurse come to her house for several hours a day, every day, for like 10 days or something after she got home from the hospital. And if you think about that as an investment in that child's life, you know, here's this vulnerable period in which someone is learning to be a mother. And we want to check in to see that the baby is gaining weight, that the mother is not experiencing postpartum depression that she's getting basic information on like this is how you talk to your baby and this is how you put your baby to sleep and this is how you come up with a schedule and this you know these sorts of things and what it means for society to be committed to that as a universal program it didn't matter that she was a university professor it didn't matter what it was you know this new baby who's come into our society merits us investing in it from the very beginning and then of course she moved to california and she was like where is my nurse that's going to come to my house and make me a cup of tea and talk to me about breastfeeding and you know and i really have to push back against the idea that we can't afford it because we choose to spend money on so many things in this country and it is not making sure that every child the moment they come into the world even before they come into the world are invested in in these very basic ways i mean i live in texas where we have one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the high income world it's absolutely outrageous it disproportionately falls on women of color and i just think it would be impossible to convince me that as one of the you know as a as a as a productive state in an incredibly wealthy country, we could not make the same decisions around investing in prenatal care and reducing maternal mortality and like that, that early birth you know, postpartum period. And that's just one example, but I think it's a, an illustrative one of what I mean about, I, I think the moral framework about like people making bad choices, a newborn didn't make choices. And they're now a member of our society, regardless of what genes they have and regardless of what parents they have. And we have so many things that we could be investing in um, that are truly universal around children that we're not doing right now. Yeah, though I could see the pushback from your own liberal colleagues about a GWAS score if it turned out, say, Blacks had a higher score on this or that that leads to these social ills. and then they would be afraid that conservatives would, would then go, you see, this is what we've been saying all along, you know, and, and, th and then you, you end up down the race rabbit hole. And so I could, you could sort of see the fear of what you're doing on the part of your own liberal colleagues. Like, let's not put a number on that. It could be used. Be abused. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously there is there is fear from many people that genetics will be misappropriated for racist ends. and. I, it's never been my intention to minimize that fear or the, the possibility of anything bis being misused. Um, I think that's true of every technology. We see this as true of every technology. You know, everything that we have learned about like algorithmic bias is, um, you know, the internet and computing and machine learning have ushered in these amazing tools. And they can also be used to bake in ways, bake in biases that are discriminatory against, against people of color. That doesn't mean we are going to stop computing, right? Or that we're going to stop using the internet. It means that we're going to be in continuous conversation about how is this technology evolving? 
what policies and regulations do we need to put into place to keep it from being misused? Um, and so I don't think there's any reason to suspect that our tasks for genetics will be any different than our tasks for other forms of disruptive, powerful technologies. Mm. Yeah, let me correct myself on that when I say conservatives might glom onto that. Most conservatives are more liberal than liberals were in the 1950s on these kinds of issues. I'm talking about like the people you you talked in here about, uh, Jared, Jared Taylor, the white supremacist leader. So here, mm -hmm. I'll just read this portion. And uh, your other colleague, Robert Plowman, in uh, his book, Blueprint, wrote that polygenetic scores should be understood as uh, as fortune tellers that can foretell our futures from birth. Jared Taylor, the white supremacist leader, argued that Plowman's book should destroy the basis for the entire egalitarian enterprise of the last 60 or so years. He seized on Plowman's claim that for many outcomes, quote, environmental levers for change are not within our grasp. And then quoting Taylor, this is a devastating finding for the armies of academics and uplift artists, uplift artists, who think every difference in outcome is society's fault. He continued, and although Blueprint includes nothing about race, the implications for racial justice are just as colossal. So when I say they, I mean the, the Jared Taylors yeah. uh, of the world. I, yeah. Maybe yeah. I should get a t-shirt that made that says Uplift Artist. I kind of like yes, that. Yes, Uplift phrase. Artist. I like that. <laughs> That's good. All right, let me. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting that we're, we're talking about that particular quote because it really speaks to me as to why I think my book is important. I really do. I wrote it despite knowing that it's going to be controversial and despite getting a lot of blowback from my colleagues for it, because I do think it's really, really important, given the way the science is moving and accelerating, to be able to formulate why Jared Taylor is wrong. Like, why is genetics not fundamentally threatening to the egalitarian project? I think I have a good sense of that, but I don't think that many people are that comes naturally to them. We're so used to thinking of genes inequality as enemies. And I, I, I don't wanna be in that vulnerable spot. I'm not gonna see genetics to the most pernicious voices anymore. I don't think we can. Yeah, no, your book does that perfectly. I was gonna use this example, where's my notes here, the seed corn example that Richard Hernstein used. Uh, even if the seed corn are essentially genetically identical, you plant them in different rows and, and, and nurture them differently, you're going to get different outcomes, obviously. But the, the key point there, let me just read what, what I think you had written there on that. Um, the more, let's see, the more pronounced the, uh, what, sorry, <laughs> uh, different environments produce different outcomes. The more uniformly beneficial the climate, the more pronounced the effects of genetic difference. That's the counterintuitive mm -hmm. thing, because we think of genes yeah, as just that's very counterintuitive. Yeah. Well, I think we can we can look to examples, and I talk about this in the book. You know, genes are not destiny, and as we change environments, we see the relationship between genes and outcomes also change, but they can change in ways that are varied and unpredictable. So we see environments where what they do is, you know, what many people call a Matthew effect: the rich get richer. So you know, everyone benefits. But the people who had pre-existing advantages benefit the most. Um, on the other hand, we also see interventions that are raising the floor, right? We might think of them as equity promoting. They're benefiting everyone, but they're benefiting the most vulnerable the most. Um, one of the things that I find really powerful about genetics is its potential to allow us to see that. Right now, when we do a randomized control trial of an intervention or evaluate a policy. We're really focused on the average treatment effect. Is this work, you know, what is this moving the needle on average? But that's alighting an enormous amount of heterogeneity of differences between people. And some people are benefiting a little and some people are benefiting a lot. Who is benefiting from what we're trying in education or what we're trying in health policy? That is a question that is really difficult to answer. And now we can have people spit in a tube and for like 60 bucks a pop, get their genetic information that gives us coarse, messy information on a lot of different predispositions, right? Like what, what was your predisposition towards obesity, towards type two diabetes, towards struggling in school? And I think as a scientific tool, 
that's really remarkable actually i mean it would have been unfathomable in like 19 well some people would have fathomed it but it would have sounded like science fiction in like 1995 to be able to do that um with such ease now all right let's talk about last two big topics social justice and free will and determinism <laughs> agency and so on so, <laughs> some light so, easy things just some light yeah 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 you, yeah, yeah. You, uh, you, you channeling john rawls you ask what sort of society would you want if you didn't know what the outcome yeah. of the genetic lottery was going to be, well, I guess my answer would be, uh, I want equal opportunity for inequalities. Uh, I, I don't care how, how equal or unequal the outcomes are. I want equal opportunity, not outcomes, because people are so different, as you've been pointing out mm -hmm. here. And uh, But you push back against that in the book, because that's kind of a meritocracy thing. Even if I grant that we're not there yet, you know, that that we don't have equal opportunities. Maybe maybe the problem is we never will. Maybe maybe this is it. Um, but I mean, what 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 difference does it make how much more money Jeff Bezos has than me? I don't really care. Uh, I mean, I have enough. You know, like the joke. Mm -hmm. You know, I have something Jeff Bezos doesn't have. What's that? Enough. Okay. You know, <laughs> and um, as long as you know all the lowest boats are you know up at uh, by the t raising tide to some minimum level. You know, three square meals a day and health care and a roof over your head and so on. Um, beyond that, you know, what? Why? Why would I care if somebody is it, it, the, the outcomes are so unequal as long as the bottom is is reasonably high? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot to respond to there. I think one. So one thing I want to just kind of um, query about is when you say you want equal opportunities what that looks like. Because I think oftentimes when people talk about equal opportunity, they mean treating everyone exactly the same. And an example that I really like thinking about, because I think it pushes on some of our definitions of equal opportunity, is the Americans with Disabilities Act. So the Americans with Disabilities Act says that everyone is should have an equal opportunity to enjoy and, and use places of public accommodation. And that's a really interesting thing, equal opportunity to use and enjoy a place of, of public accommodation. You couldn't, for instance, say, well, everyone has to use the same staircase, so this is equality of opportunity. And it doesn't matter to me that some people are able to use the staircase and some people can't use the staircase. What's being equalized is, um, not just the structure, but something about people's ability to, to use the structure, participate in the structure, enjoy the structure, interact in the structure with other people as equals. I don't think we've thought enough about what that means in terms of education and labor markets. A lot of times when people say equal opportunity, they mean, well, every, you know, something about well, we've given, you know, we've given everyone like the same, the, the same, you know, they're all going through public school, all right, or we've equalized some aspect of schooling. But is that really equalizing their opportunity if children are coming into school with different learning needs, right? So I, you know, I, I think a lot of what this, the kind of the rhetoric about equality of opportunity and equality of outcome misses is, what do we really need mean by opportunity in a world in which people are beginning their lives and in particular going into school in very different places? Yeah. Um, I uh, talk John, about well, this Jonathan, in the book. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, Jonathan Haidt makes a point like, for example, the, when the U.S. Army I integrated in the 1950s, uh, blacks were quite a ways behind whites on a standardized tests. So they said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to pour more resources into getting the blacks up to the level of the whites. And they did. And it did. Uh, and that kind of intervention, that's what I mean. So not that anybody gets any special privileges, but that no one's held back because of their background uh, or, or something like that. So you as a woman, you should be able to be CEO of Google or program there or you, whatever you want, whatever you personally want. Uh, no obstacles. No one's going to say, oh, you know, women, they can't do this or that. Uh, you know, the old Mad Men 1950s. There's still guys like that, but not many, uh, you know, and th those kinds of opportunities are opening up more and more rapidly. And th so at some point, it, it'll never be utopian, but 
there's no obstacles for you personally to do pretty much whatever you want. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you can play in the NBA, my case, or whatever. Um, too short. But but just that, that no one's purposely restricting me. And, and that's what I mean by equal opportunities. And, of course, there's going to be uh, uh, unequal outcomes, inevitably, individually. I guess maybe socially we don't want any group differences because historically that's usually meant – some uh, uh, opportunities that were not available for racial or racist or misogynist reasons. Yeah, I mean, I, so when we're thinking about like, do we care about equality of outcomes? The question that keeps going in my head is which outcomes are we talking about? I, I, so, so often these conversations are focused specifically around money. And I do think that there is a point in which inequality of monetary resources of wealth of the hoarding of wealth by a few people does corrode significantly the quality of life for large numbers of people who don't have have wealth um but i don't think that our conversation about equality should be only focused on wealth so take for example um what the economists and case and angus deaton have been uh calling attention to in terms of the deaths of despair amongst white Americans without a college degree, right? So here we're seeing inequality of lifespan. We're seeing inequality of um, mental anguish, right? Where we have this epidemic of suicidality and drug overdoses, complications from alcoholism. Um, you know, when I think about in what ways have people been left behind in America? And in what ways have inequalities become really, you know, falling and along these fault lines of, of higher education versus no higher education? It's not just, you know, the depression of wages amongst non-college educated Americans. It's the ways in which other things that we care about, again, this, like, what are the ingredients of a good life in terms of your relationships in terms of your felt sense of security and in your sense of lack of precarity, that that's a form of inequality that I think we should be caring about. And, and in some ways it matters less to me whether or not we get more people through university. Like, I, I mean, I, I think being able to go to college is just like amazing into itself. And like when I walk through college campuses and I see my students, I just am filled with envy about them. Cause I'm like, your job is to study and people have organized this <laughs> material for you. And this is wonderful. Like enjoy it. Um, I know. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I don't care. Like I don't care as nearly as much about getting more people through college as I do as making sure that, that ability to live a long, healthy, happy life is more equal regardless of whether or not you were good at formal schooling. That's kind of my prior on this. Yeah, I would not disagree with that. In fact, I would wholeheartedly disagree with that. I agree with that. But I, you know, I've been reading the um, sort of anti-racism books, you know, Ibram X. Kendi mm -hmm. and, and others. And it, it, as I understand it, the problem is not so much that there are racist assholes like Jared Taylor out there. There are, but not many compared to 50 years ago, say. It's that um, when they say systemic or baked in or whatever, they mean these kind of decades long or maybe even centuries long differences. So you talk about, say, not just income differences, but wealth. That is yes. home ownership and, yes. you know, and, and, and investment in the stock market and whatever your tools for retirement are. Um, and that just takes a long time to, to kind of build that up generationally. If you're using race as a measure, I guess that, that it would be racially across generations. So to that extent, you didn't get into this too much in your book, but but just, you know, are, are, have you thought about reparations and or UBI? Yeah. Like what uh, as a social solution to these long-term problems? Yeah, I mean, I, um, you know, I will say that I am not an expert in the, the issues around reparations. Um, you know, one thing that came up in the New Yorker article is that I was, was on sabbatical with William Darity, who's well known for his work in economics on reparations for slavery. 
when I hear people, so one, you're exactly right, right? Like there's this, this historical legacy of racism from redlining to who is excluded from the, the GI Bill to, um, I would also add to that uh, what Harriet Washington has called environmental racism. So for instance, if you look at a map of Austin and you see where was their quote unquote Negro district and where were industries that were polluting put, it's the same map, right? So in terms of exposure to environmental toxins that we know have these adverse neurodevelopmental effects that also is born disproportionately by black children in America um, led some of the clearest evidence for environmental uh, toxicity comes from the effects of lead on IQ, um, on, on other self-regulatory capacities. I get a little bit frustrated with this. It's such a large problem how could we ever begin to do it? We are a country that put a man on the moon, right? Like we are a country that, you know, did the Marshall Plan and rebuilt, you know, large parts of Europe in the wake of World War II. We, we are capable of amazing things when there's a collective political will. Um, we are just not committed to detoxifying the environments of black children in this country and so i think if we had political will around these things if we really thought of this as like you know the manhattan project but for detoxifying the environments of children that are experiencing the like environmental legacy of racism um we could do it we just have chosen to invest our resources elsewhere um Given that, you know, and, and obviously some of my colleagues disagree with me, um, a lot of people are thinking, oh, we're going to, if we start studying the genetics of intelligence or self-regulatory personality traits, you know, what if we find something that suggests there's black-white differences? And personally for me, science has a capacity to surprise us in all sorts of ways. I don't think that's what we're going to find. I think that the legacy of racism in America is so clear um, and that if we really invested time into addressing it, we would see that um, there's extraordinary potential in children of all colors. That's 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 my my genuine personal uh, personal and scientific belief there. Well, as you know, uh, conservatives argue rather differently. I've had let's see, I had Shelby Steele. On the podcast, Jason Hill, John McWhorter, uh, you know, all African Americans who dis largely disagree with the idea of reparations, and they usually point to someone like Thomas Sowell, who has you know, written whole books on this subject of, like, black immigrants, mm -hmm. for example, from Haiti. Uh, they don't have the same kind of problems as longer generations of blacks who have been here. So the question is why, you know, if it's something as simple as racism based on skin color, then how come they're not being discriminated against? or Jews who came here in the you know, 20s and 30s uh, with immigration and all the anti-Semitic uh, restrictions they experienced. You know, they couldn't even go to, uh, you know, most of the Ivy League colleges were restricted. Health clubs were restricted and so on. And, and, and yet somehow, you know, they just built their own schools. They said, well, to hell with it. We're, we don't need the government. We're just gonna do it ourselves. So this gets into this kind of personal agency free will thing. You know, I asked Shelby Steele, I read Shelby Steele, uh, President Johnson's famous uh, quote, you know, you can't take a, a, a man who's been hobbled his whole life and bring him to the start line and say, OK, you're free to race against everybody else. That's a pretty clear and obvious example. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, at, at Shelby's response is, uh, well, we're past that now. We're we, you know, we're free now. And and I said, well, what about, the, you know, you lift yourself up by your own bootstraps is the line that everybody uses. And what so the rebuttal is, well, what if you don't have boots <laughs> to lift yourself up by? Because some people don't. And his answer was. Get your own boots. Make them if you have to. In other words, this is that kind of just world theory that conservatives embrace. Uh, the world is pretty just. It's pretty fair. And if, you know, you're falling behind, you just made bad decisions. You made wrong choices. You should not have gotten involved in that gang when you were a teenager. You should have chosen to run with other uh, people or you, you married the wrong person or you selected the wrong job or you shouldn't have quit high school, you know. Uh, you know and they'll say things like, uh, you know, graduate from high school, get a job, don't have kids until you get married. Those are the three guarantees to keep you out of poverty. Success those are volitional. So-called. Yeah. Those are, those are volitional choices. You, you respond to that. 
my response is <laughs> there's a lot of different things I could respond to with that. I guess I want to come back to this question of who gets second chances even when they've made less than ideal choices. I think if we look at the ways in which privilege works in America, what advantaged parents do for their kids. They don't just try to invest in them not making bad choices. They also try to buffer the consequences of their choices from being catastrophic. I often think that the loudest voices saying that people have made choices that lead them to deserving whatever that means, their poor outcomes in life, are often people who, if they interrogated their own lives, they will see that none of us has made a series of perfect choices in our lives. And a, a society in which there is space to have made different choices and still have access to health care, right? And still have some ingredients of life that I think are fundamental to human dignity, regardless of people's decisions in life. That feels just very important to me as a, as a moral commitment. Um, and I, I just also want to reflect on the fact that, like, it's so interesting to me that conversations so often turn to, you know, to exactly what you're talking about, about like, what's my opinion on race or what's my opinion on reparations? Like, I am a psychology professor. Like, I study child and adolescent development. I have my own personal opinions on reparations as a policy. But the extent to which the question of genetics is so tightly entwined in people's minds with the questions of um, race and racism is just really remarkable. I, it's, it's, it, it's almost impossible to talk about genes without talking about race in America. Um, whereas in my mind, uh, you know, genetics are about what each individual is bringing to the equation. Um, and, you know, the, the pernicious effects of racism, how I, how I, how I think we as a society should address those, like the question of genetic causes doesn't actually seem super relevant to me, to the question of like, should we be committed to a multiracial democracy in which everyone thrives? Like, I think the answer to that is yes, regardless of the outcome of any genetic study. Yeah, people confuse uh, scientific questions with moral issues. Uh, you know, rights are defended rationally through means other than the kinds of things you do as a social scientist practicing empirical science. Uh, or, or we just declare them inalienable, you know, full stop. <laughs> they're, they're, they're real because we said they are and we have a big uh, military to protect our rights. OK, well, whatever your justification yeah. is. So we're yeah. so we think, should be committed yeah, thinking about, to think about what we owe each other. What do we owe each other regardless of their body, regardless of their brain, regardless of their choices? And I think there are things that we owe each other. Regardless of what the GWAS score is or the racial <laughs> yeah. differences and IQ scores <laughs> yes. are, or a yeah. more current example I've been involved in is the trans movement. You know, what percentage of peep kids are truly gender dysphoric and, and so on, with the implication that if it's not a big enough number or percentage, then society's not going to offer equal rights for trans. Well, it, it shouldn't matter what the number is. If it's just one person, you know, they're, they're a citizen of the United States, they're protected by the Constitution, full stop. It doesn't matter what the percentage is. People get confused about that, I think. Uh, like, you know, uh, whether homosexuality is genetic or not, uh, you know, should matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> they should be treated equally either way. But for the longest time, mm -hmm. of course, gay, gays were arguing it's not a lifestyle choice because that was being thrown against them. You just made a bad choice. And we can help you correct that through these these uh, reparative, uh, restorative, whatever they were, reparative programs. And mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it, but, but either way, I mean, whatever the, the genes or the evolutionary origins of homosexual, whatever the story turns out to be, it doesn't matter in terms of the rights of homosexuality. 
And uh, anyway, it's, it's, uh, that, that's neither here nor there on that. Okay, last, um, wait, there was something else I was going to ask you. Oh, yes. Yeah, so uh, on that question, uh, j- just knock this one out of the ballpark for us. The, the kind of the oversimplified version of what Charles Murray was arguing in the bell curve, you know, IQ is largely heritable or it's at least half heritable or whatever. There are differences between people in, in IQs, obviously. Oh, there's group differences. Yes, there are group differences. Ashkenazi Jews and then Asians and then whites and then, okay, wait a minute now. All right, so there's racial differences. And then the last step, and since it's so heritable, therefore these races are uh, you know, better or worse or lower or higher or whatever, and they can't do anything about it. So that that's, I know you addressed that a little bit, just knock that one out of the ballpark for us. Yeah, I mean, I think the the classic rejoinder to that was this analogy of two gardens, right? And one is um, has like the perfect soil and the perfect light and the perfect water and the perfect fertilizer. And you look at it and the differences in the heights of the plants is due to the genetic differences between the plants and it, right? So like right now, my mist flower is going like gangbusters and, you know, my, uh, my salvia is struggling in this heat and, you know, but they're genetically different plants and they're, they're thriving differently given the exact same conditions. And then you're looking over at this other garden and you're like, all the plants are short there. So therefore, it must be that they are all the genetically short plants. But that other garden is, you know, in the shade and has like yucky clay soil and no fertilizer and no water and, um, you know, the conditions for thriving are not the same. It would be an obvious logical fallacy to say, okay, within this set of environments, the differences are genetic. So therefore, the differences with this other environment are also genetic. We can see that really, really clearly. Um, And that's the exact same thing that Charles Murray is doing in the bell curve. He's saying, look, in white Americans, the differences in how far you go in school are heritable. And over here, we see that people don't go as far as school. It must be that there's different genes in this garden without taking into consideration the massively different environmental experiences that Black Americans in particular have experienced as the historical legacy of slavery. So it's just a really basic, it's, you know, I I talk about it as like, it's really tempting, right? It seems so logical. It's like Freud where you're like, you're reading along and it's like, it sounds like it's, and then you're like, wait, what? Like where, how did we get from here? Like one does not follow from one, from the other. Um, and so I think so much, um, so much heat has been thrown around just the, the use of the word intelligence because of that logical fallacy. And again, I think, to, I mean, to kind of go back to your conversation about race and also about sexual orientation, So many of our conversations about genes are conscripted into our politics of responsibility. So because the the next line in there is like, and it is genetic. And so therefore we can't fix it. And so therefore we aren't responsible for it. Like we can have people who experience conditions of being an underclass in America without being socially responsible for changing it. And I think the latter two parts of that syllogism are just completely wrong. Like we can't assume we know why there are racial differences. And I don't think the question of why there are racial differences are is all that relevant to our, our questions of responsibility in order to make everyone included in our society and in its prosperity. Yeah, and then on the, on the flip side of that, do you want to address epigenetics and the kind of pop version that <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can change my genes by meditating or if I eat a paleo diet, it's going to reprogram my body. Yeah, epigenetics is such a, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame that it's become such a buzzword because it is such an interesting area of science. In my own lab, we um, increasingly study uh, patterns of DNA methylation, which is one kind of epigenetic marker that you can see in the genome that is related to which parts of the, the genome be, are being read in a particular tissue at a particular time. Um, I don't think there's anything re- remotely contradictory about the study of genetics and epigenetics. I don't think epigenetics is this like get out of jail free card from struggling to to make sense of what we know about genetics. And a lot of people kind of bring it up in that context. It's another frame of information about 
you know, all of these frames of information are not competing, they're complementary. We want to know about the environment, we want to know about the genome, we want to know about the biome, we want to know about the hormones, we want to know about the epigenome, um, we want to know about psychology and behavior, we want to know about parenting and peers. I want to know about all of that in order to build the most comprehensive view of human variability that I can. Yeah, well, I think you've done it. I think this is the most important book on this subject. Uh, in ever really, I mean, it's a building science. And <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> so, uh, not really. It's super important, really important, especially because of the last couple chapters on uh, implications for policy and also for free will and, and moral culpability and all that. Because you address the hot button issues there. What's next on your on your plate, your research writing plate? You know, that's a really good question. I'm gonna when this book promotion circus is over, I really owe my postdocs and my PhD students um, some time and investment. I'm really interested right now in what I think of as double lottery studies. So studies where we're looking at the genetic lottery, where we have genetic information on parents and kids, and then also some other natural experiment or um, randomized control trial where there's also a lottery of environmental experience. And I think when we can combine those sources of information, we can do some really interesting work on this question that everyone's interested in, which is not just genes or environment, but genes and environment. How do they combine? So I'm hoping to think about that. Um, I'm maybe going to write a second book. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. Oh, you should. <laughs> you absolutely got to do it. No, no, you're a good, this is, you're a good writer. No, I, I enjoyed the book. Well, I listened to it on audio like I do most of my books. It was a good read. <laughs> so yeah. thank you, Paige. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. We went uh, almost two hours. So that's that was a good, long, yeah. super interesting conversation. Very important work. Oh, thank you very much for having me.